It's uh, Benjamin Ray here with another episode of Sustainability Live. Today I'm here with Adam Peak. How you doing? I'm doing great. It's another day. Uh, it's beautiful. It snowed here in Salt Lake uh, last night, so uh, ready for the ready to go. Get some fantastic snowboarding on at some oh, point. That's time. great. It's, it's that time of year for sure, and hopefully you can enjoy yourself over the next couple of weeks. And and uh, you know, I wanted to mention to you, I, I love how your name is E Adam Peak. It's it's solely like uh, you know action hero name E Adam. So that's even though it's Adam, that's how I think of you as. So you know, I'm I'm not well. There's a couple of reasons why it's there. So number one, I added it to uh, this is sort of a silly reason, but to filter out um bad automation on linkedin so i'll uh -huh. get a lot of things that say like hey e i love what you're blah 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 i'm like you don't love anything because you just filtered out so that's one of the reasons but my my legal first name is edward and i thought uh you know maybe it would be a better author sounding name like c.s lewis or yeah, aw totally. tozer or something like yeah, that yeah or if you join screen actors guild you've got it all right there you know? oh that if you can see my face right now uh which you probably can on linkedin live i should not be in the screen actors guild <laughs> no man it's about content well i'm happy to have you on here really yeah. happy to have you you know so you're you're a fellow ram uh, csu so We've got that in common and uh welcome welcome yeah to show. it's so. it's the harvard of the rockies as everybody knows i love that yeah <laughs> Excellent. okay well good good so tell our viewers a little bit about what you're up to and uh what you've been working on man so many it 2020 has been crazy for a lot of people um you know for me just you know personally there's been a lot of really incredible things happening and then also like visits to the ER and, you know, just, just, you know, dealing with working from home with five children and one wife. And so, you know, it's been, it's been pretty cool, but, uh, and challenging. So, you know, professionally, uh, a lot of stuff Ben is going on. So I've got, uh, sometime my Ted talk is going to, my TEDx Salt Lake city talk is going to go live. Um, I recorded it live three months ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm just waiting. Uh, it got submitted, and I I was told like, "Hey, it'll be live." And then it was like, "Just kidding." So it's in some sort of queue to get approved. But I got to talk about um, how packaging is is an incredible industry um, on the red dot in Salt Lake City, and that was a fantastic experience for me. Um, so I've got uh, I'm hosting a podcast that I co-host with uh, my friend Ted Tate. We've been doing that. We're in our third season, and we just tell the story of people in the packaging world and what they're up to. So I don't get to be interviewed all that often. So this is really cool to be on the other side, um, and that's been going crazy. We got like a sponsor and all this kind of stuff, and then. In my full-time job at Fortis, uh, just last week, so I live in Salt Lake City. Fortis, at the time when I started a year ago, had 13 facilities. I've never had a job where a manufacturing facility is in the state that I live. And so we acquired maybe one of the most innovative companies that I've ever seen in the packaging industry uh, here in Orem, Utah, called Kala Packaging. Mm -hmm. So they're now part of the company that I work for, which is really cool because I've competed against these guys for years and they're so freaking good at what they do. I could just never beat them. And now it's like, oh, I can't beat them, join them. So <laughs> um, they are, I mean, from, they do a lot in, and we can get into the role that digital packaging plays on sustainability a little bit perhaps, but um, lots of innovative digital, you know, flexible packaging, digital label um, stuff that we're just kind of, digging sinking our teeth into a little bit so um it's super cool um and uh yeah i'm i've been hosting webinars across the world um so it's been a fun it's it's been a fun last couple of months so, so interesting but fun you've made the best of it and I, I think you're doing well from listening to the podcast so talking about packaging i'd like to get into that a little bit i know in, in uh, some of your posts, you've talked about there is no perfect packaging mm -hmm. solution. So can you get into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I just I, I just posted that up uh, this morning, actually. So and, and I've talked about this before, um, you know, being in in the packaging industry now, I've been a I've been in sourcing, I've done some design 
and now in kind of business development, a channel partnership, I found that brands will sometimes not move, you know, perfection is the enemy of progress kind of a thing. And so, um, I, I, my post this morning was basically, I can tell you what's wrong with almost any, you know, quote, sustainable packaging. Like Mm -hmm. you can always, you can poke holes in almost any of it because there's no silver bullet. You know, there's people are different. Industries are different. Regulations are different. If you're a multinational company, I mean, for example, you it's it's really hard to recycle glass products in Utah. You have to it requires a lot of effort. Well, glass would be considered a a highly recyclable product, but most of it just gets tossed in the landfill in Utah because of regulations and infrastructure and stuff like that. So, um, you know, or take like aluminum. Well, aluminum is 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 awesome. Uh, some you know some of it has BPA liners in it. Some of it gets shrink sleeves attached to it. So there's there's all sorts of issues. And what we've started to try to figure out is just say like, let's just take the next step. Let's make the next best decision for your brand, and and then tomorrow we'll do it again. Not literally mm-hmm. tomorrow, but you know like the next iteration. Let's take another step forward. And, um, and some people are going to take the big leaps. Um, and with that comes risk. Um, but you know, they're, they're doing it and, and other large brands are now starting to funnel money into it, which is accelerating the innovation process. So, you know, you've got Unilever, uh, they just announced, uh, in, I think it was June, a carbon rating system. They're going to carbon rate all of their products. 70,000 products is it's a big undertaking. So wow. P&G has a Holy Grail project. Uh, Millipor Sigma has a smash packaging. There's just, there's a lot of stuff happening. Walmart has been a big player. Amazon has been a big player with uh, climate pledges. So it's hard to keep up with everything, but it's, it's, not, it's not talk any longer. It's a lot of action, but understanding that the action hasn't resulted in perfection. We'll just keep kind of moving forward towards that. So so you're saying that there isn't really a silver bullet. So when you have customers who just say, come on, I just want a sustainable package, you can kind of say, well, it, it kind of varies. You know, it varies on where you live. It varies on how you can recycle. It varies on where it's manufactured in terms of, you know, cost to manufacture or how it's what I've learned bubble wrap to get somewhere. You know, there are so many things that go into it that there isn't really just one sustainable solution. But if you're working towards something and you're doing a little bit better every day, like most things in life, over time, it gets better and it starts to compound. The more you work on it, the more people get get uh, involved in it. Mm-hmm. And that's one way that you're seeing the industry change for the better. Yeah, my, my I kind of throw it into, four, right now it's kind of four buckets. So when someone says, you know, we need to be more sustainable, it's like, well, what, we have, you've got to baseline it. How are you measuring it? And what you'll find is, unless you're a really large brand, you probably don't have a baseline for what is already sustainable. So defining what is more is impossible. So just Um, an idea of, well, I I, I want it to be earth friendly or biodegradable or compostable or made from post consumer. Once you get past that, it's kind of like, what do you mean? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I I walk them through four different buckets. Um, You know, I say, well, let's, let's talk about sustainability from four perspectives. Three of them are, are fairly cut and dry. So number one, is it good for your product? Uh, For example, food waste uh, globally is the third largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions behind the United States and China. And so putting it put creating packaging that is is increasing food waste or you're throwing away more food, even though it might be, you know, biodegradable or compostable, whatever. If it's worse for the product, it's significantly worse for the environment. Um, And so, you know, is it is it good for the product is your first bucket. Number two is, is it good for the planet? That's pretty subjective still. Um, you know, you're walking through things. Uh, is it, you know, PCR, like you said, is it recyclable? Is it, it can it be recycled? All that stuff. And then the other two are, is it good for your people? Meaning, is it on brand? Because if you can't sell it, or let's say you re- totally redesign your product and it gets lost on a store shelf, as an example, then you're going to have a lot of obsolescence and that's a lot of wasted energy and is it good for your profits and that sucks to hear for a lot of people but by definition you can't sustain business if you cut your margins such that you can no longer keep producing products you know it sounds so silly but it's like you can't spend 
uh, Tom Zaki has a book called The Future of Packaging. And he says the most sustainable packaging is 24 karat gold. Hmm. You think about it, it's renewable, no one's throwing it away, it has value, but are you gonna buy your stick of deodorant for $50,000 deposit <laughs> on your gold? You're never gonna do it. No. So yeah, it's probably the most sustainable, but it, it's never gonna happen, so. That's right. Yeah. Well, I think I think once you go through your buckets, you know, you really start to educate your your customer. It sounds like and uh, work with them, and I and I, I think that it will take a lot of steps working together to really come up with solutions that are sustainable. You know, not just you or not just a consumer, but big small companies. You know, what are you seeing? What are you seeing in that regard? Yeah, I mean, it it, it has to be a collaborative effort. Um, you know, between so. So my, my first suggestion, again, kind of in that bucket is get packaging engineers involved early on in any project you have. And, and it, it's crazy to me. I mean, big, massive companies who have 50 packaging engineers on staff and they bring them in at the last minute on product development. And it's like, what, 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 what do you think about this? Yeah, it's crazy to me that this happens because like they have to be involved. They your packaging is part of your product. So when Very you well. are when you are innovating, you have to bring in these engineers. I'm not an engineer by trade. Um, there's there's incredible engineers out there. There are companies if you don't have an engineer that you want to get somebody in on a project basis, but get them involved early. It will save you so much headache and so much time. And you have to collaborate with them early on. And then also collaborate with your suppliers and your vendors. Uh, the mm -hmm. chances are that they are out there meeting with material suppliers. You know, some of them are, some of us are advocating uh, with political organizations. Um, you know, the IOPP, which is the Institute of Packaging Professionals in the U.S., along with the World Packaging Organization, works with the U.N. on certain things. So. You know, it, it's it's important to bring in everybody early on and not relegate packaging to a line item on a cost of goods sold. You know, it's especially if you have a re I mean, some of it is 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 maybe going to be a little bit more commodity based. But if you have a product that you're selling on our shelf, like it's you, it, it's that that's it's part of marketing it's part of uh you know supply chain it's part of logistics it's part of legal it's part of compliance it's part of you know it's it's a critically important thing so yeah going through that journey and collaborating together um you know like the great uh the great philosopher vanilla ice said uh you know to you got to stop you got to collaborate you got to listen um you know you just you need that it, we're, we're never going to move forward if everybody just keeps doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So, um, that's right. Well, it's, uh, you know, when you're going through your buckets, you talk about good decisions. And so I wonder when you say you get all these people together, are there different uh, competing agendas sure. that, that define good? And how do you resolve that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, it's hard to say, like, how do you resolve it? Because what you find out is, and people are going to start nodding if you work for like a CPG company is, the power dynamics within a company are different from company to company. So one company might value uh, cost savings driving to the bottom line more so than they do innovation. And another company might be like, I don't care. We are going to innovate. We're going to drive. We're going to be the, the first movers in this industry. Um, you know, others are going to be more about their brand and the you know how how is it going to look how's our how's our printing going to look and mm -hmm. you know, it has to be so there there's always i, I like it would be nice if like the, everybody wins but at the end of the day you end up with you know compromise so for example let's say you really value price and you really value um you know recycled content and so you're going to get into a folding carton box, like a cereal box, if, you know, or a candy box or something like that. And you're going to put it into a 100% recycled uh, clay coated news back, which is like the gray. You've seen the boxes that are like gray on the inside and they've got white on the outside. Mm -hmm. You're going to make some graphic um, compromises there because gray is coming through. It might not be as vibrant as you mm -hmm. want it to be. So 
Um, while it would be great if everything could be accomplished all at the same time, oftentimes it just can't be. And, you know, you got to walk people through that and you really find out, you know, where the, where those power dynamics lie for sure. So, so are, are you finding that within different companies that there are groups that do collaborate or is it very siloed in terms of those agendas, you know, to, I mean, I, I, th I would think you have to see collaboration or you're going to get a lot of no's or that's your job to say no. How do you, how do you navigate that? In company? <laughs> very, very carefully. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, it, it, there, there are plenty of companies that are completely siloed. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of that is intentional. Um, you know, it's just part of how they do business. They, they want that kind of, um, checks and balances, I guess. Mm -hmm. I find that those companies tend to not iterate fast enough and they're, they're losing market share right now because they're not agile. They're not collaborative. You know, they're not willing to, to come together quickly, you know, increase their speed to market and, and get out there, but they exist. And, and again, I'm not going to cast aspersions on any particular company, but uh, they exist and it is a slow crawl towards innovation. We talk about sustainability, sustainability and innovation are, are hand in hand. Um, is it people within the companies or a company mandate top down? How, where do you find those champions really who, who are going to push this forward? Yeah, it's people. I mean, and, and really what's happening now is it's, uh, so customers and consumers. So what's happening, what, what we're seeing right now, and this might be off topic, but I'll, I'll go there anyway. So you've got the greatest increase in population growth ever in global history, right? We went from, was it 1, 1 billion people in 1900 to, I don't know, 1800 to 1. 1.6 billion in 1900. So, you know, 600 million people increase in 100 years. From 1900 to 2000, it went from 1.6 to like 7.5. So 6 billion people over 10x the growth in 100 years. And our natural resources didn't increase at the same speed. So you've got this increasing population. And now that population, particularly in the US and the EU, is made up of millennial and Gen Z buyers who are driving most of the decision making and they're demanding stuff from brands. Hmm. So while it used to be internal stakeholders who you know had that power, now it's it's brands are losing significant market share if they don't adjust. So I think we're in the middle of that shift, you know, where you have traditionally, um, you know, baby boomers and Gen X who are at the higher levels who are who used to be making decisions, but the power dynamics changed where the consumers are, are they're not just making demands like, hey, this would be nice if we could do this. It was, if you don't do this, I'm moving. I'm gonna go yeah. buy this other brand. Um, and, you know, they're, they're spending more money on it. Uh, Forbes had an article that they'll spend 10% more on a, on a product that they believe is sustainable. Um, and that, that goes back to you know messaging and things like that. So, so you're seeing that in millennials and Gen Z that they're actually uh, demanding and mm -hmm. and their the brand equity is not necessarily in uh, being loyal to one brand. It's really if a company continues to do this with their products uh, and they they're looking for a, a more sustainable solution, I believe in that mission and vision. So I'm going to buy their products because I'm going to follow what they're doing, like a Patagonia or, you know, like so yeah. many other companies that are leading the way. Yeah, absolutely. And and they're not letting them get away as much with, you know, what we'll call like greenwashing or wish cycling or because we have the internet now, you know, like I'm a young Gen X, old millennial. I don't know where I really fall, but like I can tell you if you are, I saw a packaging, maybe it was a year ago that said this packaging is made from 60%. This package is 60% compostable and 40% polyethylene on like this green message. And I was like, that's nonsense. It's just pure nonsense that you're saying to us right now. And they, they'll get called out for it. So brands are getting called out for these misleading statements, thankfully. Um, and, and, but like I said, we're still in the middle of it. You know what I mean? It's not, I wish I could say that everybody sees that, but it, it's, it's going to take time, you know, yeah. it take five, 10, 20 years. But as we were talking earlier, a little bit better every day, every year, it's going to move in the right direction. And I yeah, believe make, it is moving in the right direction. Correct. Yeah. Make, make the next right choice. That's what I tell my kids, right? Like just go, you know, don't, don't let your past failures define your future success, right? Like just yeah. 
make it make a make it your next right decision you don't have to stay going down the the rabbit hole of destruction um personally well, if, or if the country continues along with packaging waste and single-use plastic a lot of people feel we are headed toward destruction so mm -hmm. i think that you know whether it's the environment or whether it's cost or whether it's just doing the right thing uh, we are leading in the right direction and and i, I believe that's the case yeah, no, we, I, I, I have a lot. I, I have a tremendous amount of hope from what I'm seeing from these really large brands and really large retailers. You know, like I mentioned, Amazon and Walmart mm -hmm. doesn't get any bigger. And they are they are demanding stuff from their customers. Like if you would see the request that we get for sustainability audits mm. from from a company like Walmart, where it's like, I mean, we were told, like, that's not good enough. Really? You have LED lights. Okay, great. So does everybody. You're using solar power. Awesome. You need to keep going or else your packaging won't be in our store. Really? Like 2025. Yeah, it's it's wow. it's really happening. I mean, that drive is happening right now and brands are listening because we have the existential threat of climate change that we have to deal with, which is very real. Um, and then you also just have capitalistic intentions of whatever the cause is, right? Like. It's, it's a good thing that it's happening and it is happening. Good. Well, about your podcast. So I want to talk a little bit about that, about the people in packaging and how you came up with that. And what are some of the more interesting, I guess, interviews you've done and, and what you're seeing there? Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, man, I guess it's coming up on three years ago, maybe. I don't know. Post like pre COVID time to me is just this like, I, I can't, my brain doesn't quite function yet that way. But uh, I was, uh, I met uh, Ted at a industry function when humans could interact together and uh, drink alcoholic beverages at trade shows. And, and we struck up a conversation um, about hip hop music. I love hip hop music. He mm. is a hip hop producer and a packaging engineer. Mm. After we, we started to talk through the lack of voices at these shows of people of color and women specifically not not that there was they were totally devoid of it it just seemed like there was nobody was talking about it nobody really cared and it wasn't happening and so we're like well what are we going to do like you know at the time i was living in colorado springs and i'm you know selling packaging and he's a packaging engineer so we just i just said what if we started a podcast where we where we shared the stories disproportionately, um, not exclusively, because as you can see, I'm definitively a, I'm, I'm a white male. So white size, gender male. Um, and and I, do, I do a lot of the interviews, but you know, we tell the stories disproportionately of people of color and women within the industry who might not typically be getting the platforms that they deserve. Hmm. And we interview them and they talk about all the rad stuff that they're doing. So, um, you know, for example, probably one of our most listened to episodes or two episodes at the end of season two with my friend Daryl Job. Uh, Daryl is the CEO of a company called Veracool, which is a really cool company. It's a very cool company. <laughs> uh, they, they're trying to replace uh, styrofoam shipping coolers huh. with uh, uh, curbside recyclable molded fiber coolers and not just trying, they're doing it. And it's, it's really impressive. So um but daryl's story is unlike anything i'd ever heard he grew up in um in, in oakland was part of the crips gang tattooed all over i mean up onto his neck the whole nine in and out of jail in and out of homelessness and um got out of prison one time went to this guy's house as part of like a rehab um, assignment and it was this beautiful house and he said and it was this girl's dad's house he said what does your dad do and she said he sells uh he sells packaging and boxes and he was like boxes full of cocaine like this is crazy and he said from there he just realized it when he started to realize like what was happening in the packaging industry he's like i went out i saved up every dollar i could i bought a nice suit i got my tattoos removed um you know because he had pretty gnarly stuff tattooed on his body and got into it and now here he is you know running a company um, that's that you know could potentially be distributing the COVID vaccine, and you know globally in 
packaging that's not harming our environment. So it's really awesome. So I just, yeah. you know, there's all sorts of cool stories like that that are out there, but um, that was a lot of fun. It's cool. How do you, how do you find the people that are doing those innovative things? I wish I could tell you that there was some magical formula, um, but you, typically just through connecting and interacting with people on LinkedIn. Um, and, you know, I'll meet interesting people and I'll reach out to them and say, hey, can, we, can I hear your story? And they'll tell me their story. And I'm like, why don't we do a podcast episode? And there's not any, there's myself and Avelio Matos, who's a friend of mine. Um, he hosts, uh, I think you had him on, didn't you? Yeah. 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 Now that I think about it, uh, yeah. So Avelio hosts a, a really awesome podcast called Packaging Design Unboxed, uh, but there's just not a lot. There's not a lot of content created about packaging. It's a trillion dollar industry, so people aren't asked to be interviewed all that often, um, and so I just get to do it and ask them, and that's how it happens. It's there's not really a whole lot of <laughs> not a lot of planning that goes into it. So well, it's it's good to tell those stories. I mean, it's it's valuable. I think. Well, going into the next year here, uh, whether we still have COVID or not, what what innovations do you see coming up that, uh, that you're either working on or that you're knowing about you think that are going to be impactful in terms of some breakthroughs in sustainable packaging? Yeah, I mean, the, the, big, the big idea right now within sustainable packaging, specifically in where I work in and the areas I work in, which is labeling. Um, so we print labels, we print shrink sleeves, and then we print uh, flexible packaging. And the, the I, I wish I could say like, oh, there's this really, there's this one really big thing, but it's really like designing for circularity mm -hmm. and, and making sure that what, like, let's say it's a label. So one of my biggest pet peeves is that there's a lot of really simple things that we can do. So uh, there's an aluminum can allocation issue right now in the United States. It's hard to get cans. Right. Um, because aluminum is, you know, well, you know, you're in Denver, so Ball Corporation is killing it right now. They're one of the fastest growing companies. They just bought the naming rights to the, the what used to be the Pepsi Center, now it's Ball Arena. Um, you know, aluminum is hot right now. So what's happening is is a lot of these companies are getting, you know, just unprinted cans because that's all that they can get their hands on. And then they're putting shrink sleeves on it, which looks beautiful and it looks nice and all that stuff. And it's so easy to just put a little tear, just two perforations up the seam and just instruct people to tear off the shrink sleeve, throw that away. It's very minimal impact in a landfill and then recycle the aluminum can. But what happens is people don't know to do that. They, they see a can and they think I recycle this can. So they throw it in the recycling and then it can it gets scanned at a, at a, a MRF, a material recovery facility, and it, it can kick back that it's polypropylene. Mm. or PVC. So it kicks aluminum into that, contaminates it. Um, best case is it, it doesn't get scanned and it just goes back into the waste. But now you had an aluminum that could have been recycled that's not recycled. So, you know, it's there's simple things like that, you know, instructing people to remove, making labels that can be removed from aluminum cans, shrink sleeves, uh, you know, film labels, stuff like that. It's okay to just throw those in the trash. Again, is it perfect? Of course not. It's not perfect. No. In a perfect world, you just print them all and everybody would be able to do that. But we can't do that right now. Um, I actually had uh, uh, Santiago Navarro on, who's the CEO of this company called Garcon Wines. And that's pretty cool because he's making a fully 100% PCR um, wine bottle out of PET. And it's flat and kind of wide. So it's, it's optimized for e-commerce and pallet Ooh. shipping. So significantly reducing the carbon waste, um, you know, you can put a, uh, you know, a label that doesn't impact the recycling on there. And so, you know, instead of shipping wine in glass from Bordeaux to Denver, which has a really high impact, you can now ship it in a lightweight PET um, that is maximized for pallet efficiency. So that's a pretty cool innovation that I'm excited to see and, and work on uh, the labeling for that. And then, you know, within the flexible packaging world, single use, like you mentioned it, single use plastic, single use packaging is a bane on everyone's existence. Yeah. Um, 
the problem is that there's really no better alternative right now. Meaning if the alternative to putting something in a, in a pouch is a big, you know, tub that's made from that, maybe that tub is recyclable, but the amount of ener the energy analysis, the carbon analysis of getting that big tub to put your protein mix in versus getting a whole bunch of flat, you know, flat plastic pouches is if, if you're following the carbon, not following the landfill impact necessarily, then the carbon impact is significantly less on flexible packaging from soup to nuts. So, but we need better end of life on that. And so, you know, driving PCR content to encourage clean PET recycling, uh, fully, uh, you know, mono material that can be recycled, fingers crossed soon to be curbside recycled, not in store recycled, you know, that could be a big win. Um, so, you know, some of those innovations are, are coming down the pike and it's a pike pipe I think it's pipe. I don't know, whatever it is, they're coming soon. They're coming, so um, it's, good, it's good to know. We've, we've got a question here that I want to address uh, from Aaron, any thoughts on packaging the cannabis industry? And that's, you know, something that we've been working on quite a bit, you know, uh, Trev, we, we do mostly cannabis packaging and, you know, the, what I see in Canada uh, through health Canada is the regulations call for sustainable and CR, child resistant packaging, mm -hmm. and Mexico is now going to be the same way. That's what they've said is sustainable and child resistant, very loose, but that's not really defined. So we're seeing that more as people just wanting, you know, the very basic sustainability, which I see as paper, you know, so we've been working on some really interesting just paper boxes that are CR, very mm -hmm. basic level, not trying to get too sophisticated with really the interpretation of that, but really moving the LPs toward moving paper by working with paper. And then obviously you can get into, you know, um, water-based inks and water-based glue, so it's fully biodegradable. But we see that as, a, as something that's going to continue to advance over the years because they're light. So if you're shipping, it's very light. It's not like glass. It doesn't take a lot to make them. And you can have some very interesting shapes with paper. So what are what are you seeing coming? Yeah, down yeah, for sure. I mean, using and, and then continuing that and uh, following the chain of custody with paper through an FSC or an SFI certification so that they're fighting deforestation is obviously, you know, critical as well. So, yeah, the cannabis industry is so fascinating to me. So, um, you know, I was living in Colorado when uh, I'm that's where I'm from. And, you know, so when Colorado became the first state to uh, legalize recreational, you know, cannabis, it was like, whoa, what do we do? You know, I mean, it's, it was crazy. And, uh, and, you know, so I got, I got uh, quite a few phone calls, you know, early on. And, um, it, I think that the industry itself is, is certainly, you know, growing and exploding and things like that. The problem that I see with, you know, creating like a, like, what are my thoughts on cannabis? the cannabis industry is really until there's a cohesive, you know, sort of like health Canada, or it, it, I'm speaking specifically in the U S I can't, I don't know much about health Canada other than you need, um, other than you need, uh, Queens, you know, French and Queens English or something like that. There's, I just, uh, that's all I really know. But, but in the United States, it's like every state has every, its own different regulations and you can't ship it across state lines and blah, 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 blah. And then the regulations are changing so much. So from, from my perspective, yes, there are, there are material considerations to, to be had, right? So uh, if, you can, if you can use paper and folding carton boxes that are child resistant, then that's fantastic. Um, but I would really encourage, and until such a time, I would really encourage looking at and partnering with digital printing companies for CBD and uh, cannabis products because of the changing regulations. So whatever gains you might have with sustainable materials, you will quickly lose when you have to throw them out um, because somebody got to be in their bonnet about some kind of ingredient. Now you have to change everything about your packaging. So, um, you know, that that's probably running lean you know, running just in time on your packaging, mm -hmm. you're going to incur, uh, you know, more, more costs, obviously, um, you know, it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but you know, it, it, again, I'm, I'm going back probably five years, four or five years when I was heavily involved in this, you know, looking at like the 280E tax laws, packaging is one of those things that does help a cannabis company with, you know, tax 
mitigation as a cost to get sold line item. So, um, you know, it's, those would be my thoughts. I, I think that it's still emerging. I mean, yeah. I'd like to say that, and again, I'm, I'm, I would need to be asking you a lot of questions on this because I know that you live and breathe it. But um, from a printing perspective, I would say stay lean, you know, go digital, don't be, you know, don't be throwing out, you know, things. So, so for example, paper packaging, lots of, it's surprising me how many people don't realize this, but if you have paper that will biodegrade, but if all that paper ends up in the landfill, that ain't biodegrading. It's just going to sit in a landfill. You can go find, you can, you can core down through a landfill right now and find newspapers from the 1930s that look pristine. So why is that? Well, it's, it's very necessary because so much food ends up in a landfill and methane is very detrimental to our environment. So you don't want food breaking down in a landfill. So you're, they're basically sealed tombs um, mm. that you don't want any water, any oxygen. You want nothing getting in there because the methane will, will become really bad for our environment. Well, because of that, because paper requires uh, water and oxygen to biodegrade and break down, it's not getting that inside of a landfill. So it will just sit there for however long it needs to sit there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's good because it has, it's a renewable resource with, with, you know, with a tree. And like I said, follow the chain of custody, but the end of life, if that paper doesn't end up getting, getting recycled and repurposed, which you would hope it would be if somebody's throwing out pallets worth of folding cartons and it does end up in a landfill and it's not biodegrade, it's not going anywhere. It's just sitting there forever. So, the good thing is it, it took up carbon and it, it's keeping the carbon and it's not turning into greenhouse gases. Well, that's, that's a good fact. Now I know where to go to find old newspapers, historical newspapers. <laughs> I don't, yeah, you, it would be quite the mining experience though, I think for you. Here's a question from Guillermo. We were talking about this yesterday about hemp papers. Uh, what, are, what are hemp materials for, for boxes printing? What do you see in terms of how um, uh, printing can be on hemp papers and, and the innovations in there? Yeah, I love uh, I love what I think hemp is going to be able to do. Again, it's still so new, but when you think about um, the the life cycle of hemp and the impact of hemp versus cutting down, deforesting a tree, I'm a I'm a big hemp proponent, and you know figuring out ways to pulp and create um, the cellulose from hemp to make paper, but not just like, Hey, this is a really cool option, but like how could, could we replace a, a, a large majority of our cellulose with hemp would be a really interesting conversation because we can grow it a lot faster. And, and then you can leave trees. Trees are our greatest uh, store of CO2. Um, and the older a tree gets, the more CO2 it, it pulls down. And so when you've cut down an old tree um, to make paper in this case, um, yeah, you're going to, you're going to be replanting, but is it, is it pulling down the carbon that we need to be, to be cooling our planet? Um, that's, that's a real question. And so I think hemp has a possibility there. Um, there's some cool things going on with people way smarter than me in the science world that are making using um, polymicrobial, um, you know, Petri dishes or, you know, uh, I don't forget what they call the bioreactors to create cellulose, mm. pulling CO2 and making cellulose. Um, so that would be super interesting. Uh, we're going to have to find some way to do it, but um, I think hemp for, for a paper source is, is incredible. And I would be one to advocate for like, uh, can, can we figure out a way to, deregulate that as much as possible so that we can fully deploy its uses, not just in packaging, but the, the health benefits and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I see there's a lot of opportunity for him as well. Mm -hmm. so. Agreed. Well, so how can people get a hold of you specifically? What's your email, uh, LinkedIn, all that stuff? And then tell us about your podcast, how to find that. Sure. So you can find me on here on, on the LinkedIn's. Um, it's probably the easiest way to do so. Um, so it's just just find Adam Peak. Uh, on e Adam E Adam Peak, or you can just search for Adam Peak. I think Adam Peak is also like a Scottish rugby player uh, when you Google him. But um, yeah, so that that's probably the easiest. And 
you know, just shoot me a message through there. Uh, I, I, I probably get more messages on LinkedIn than I do in my email inbox, which is not normal for a lot of people I understand. But um, yeah, if you want to email me, uh, there's uh, Adam at peopleofpackaging.com. So it's people of packaging, P-O-P, which is a play on words of the packaging industry. P-O-P is a point of purchase display. Shout out to the packaging nerds. So uh, yeah, Adam at peopleofpackaging.com is, uh, is an email address that you can reach me at. Um, I mean, the podcast is just available as on Apple and Google and Stitcher and SoundCloud. And, um, yeah, I mean, you can, you can check it out. There's a whole bunch of episodes. There's a lot of content. Again, we're not, we're not getting specific about like, here's the sustainable packaging episode okay. and here's the episode about, you know, bottles. It's, we're telling people stories. So it might not be, I mean, I say that like, it might not be as interesting. Oh, no, it's interesting. I mean, those, you know, lifestyle stories are interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating. I love it. So, um, yeah, that would be that would be it. And then um, I, I do a I actually forget the number, but I started this uh, texting community. So uh, if you text four, three, five, two, nine, one, seven, three, two, five, it's up on my LinkedIn as well. But text that get signed up and also I'm sending out uh, text updates. Like when my TED talk, TEDx, sorry, TEDx Salt Lake City talk finally goes live. Oh my gosh, I have to have patience with this one, but uh, I'll be sending that out via text uh, as soon as I get the link. So um, I don't know. That's kind of, I guess that's it. Excellent. Well, send great. Me, send me mail. I like getting actual <laughs> <you> mail. mail. <laughs> well, it was great to talk to you. Wealth of knowledge. Uh, if any of you have any questions, reach directly out to Adam. And uh, thanks for being on the show. And I look forward to talking to you soon. Definitely. Thanks, man. All right. See ya. Bye.